Good evening, everyone. We are in our uh, study of Hebrews 11. So last time we looked at the first seven verses uh, with the definition of what faith is. And uh, as we look at what the definition uh, of what faith is and those first believers looking at Abel and, and uh, Enoch and, and Noah. Uh, and then uh, tonight we're going to be taking a look at Abraham and what his faith is. Uh, led him to do. So we'll be looking at verses 8 through 16. Um, if you have the printout uh, of the notes, that's page 5. So page 5 in, in, the, in the notes. All right, let's begin tonight with prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, we ask that you would continue to guide us as we see uh, the blessings of uh, what faith does in our lives. Uh, for these Old Testament heroes of faith, Lord, uh, they they saw only the promises. They didn't see the fulfillment of that promise. And yet, uh, Lord, they, they clung to those promises. Help us also to cling to your promises. Even when we don't see it with our eyes, help us to see it through faith. Guide us in our study tonight for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so Hebrews chapter 11, top of page 5. And uh, we'll... Uh, so that, that will take us um, from 5 through... Through the, through the bottom of, or through page 8. So. All right, so beginning with verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Before Abraham's portrait, the author would have his readers pause a bit longer. It was only natural that he would assign the central spot in the Hall of Fame, our Hall of Faith, to the father of the faithful. Consistently, Abraham trusted God, taking him at his word and following his direction, even when there was nothing to see, and even more, more so, when what could be seen pointed only to something or seeming the seemingly impossible. Not knowing the direction, uh, so one of one of each, and we are page five in the notes. So tonight we're looking at, at the, the second page of the of the, the lesson, which is Hebrews eleven, eight to sixteen. And so we're in the middle of page five right now in the in the notes. <coughs> Yes, second, uh, yeah, so, uh, so not knowing the direction, trusting God's directive, he left his homeland in Mesopotamia. With no map in hand, but with God's call in his heart, Abraham went out into the unknown. Faith is that way. It is content to go forward blindfolded because it trusts God's leading. That unknown land was to be his inheritance, but all he ever owned of Canaan was a burial plot purchased when his beloved Sarah died in Genesis 23. God gave him no inheritance there, not even a foot of ground, Stephen recounted in Acts chapter 7, marveling at the patriarch's faith. Like some foreigner, he moved his tent from place to place in the land that had been promised to him. Nor was it any different for his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. They died not having seen, but having trusted God's promise. How could Abraham do it? The author has one answer. By faith. By faith, Abraham saw the invisible. In fact, it's amazing just how far Abraham's faith saw. He looked beyond the earthly Canaan to the eternal city in heaven. In this city, belonging wholly to God because he was its architect and actual builder, Abraham saw his real home. This was the city with foundations. Tents have only pegs which are pulled up and moved. Earthly cities have walls that stand longer and yet crumble, but this city stands forever. The heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, is how the author describes it in chapter 12, so that we cannot misunderstand. To this heavenly home, Abraham was looking forward, ever living and finally dying in expectation of it. How short-sighted we are at times. How foolish at times when we turn the binoculars around and focus on earth's sand rather than heaven's shores. Okay, and then verses 11 and 12. By faith, Abraham, 
even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, wasn't able to become a father because he, he considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. By faith, Abraham also was enabled to become a father. He was 99 years old, past the age of begetting a child when Isaac's coming birth was announced to him. Sarah also was barren, yet the two conceived a child by God's miraculous working. From such a small beginning, this one man, and from such a miraculous building, be beginning, he as good as dead, came descendants as countless as the proverbial stars in the so sky and sand on the seashore. <clears throat> Physically, all Israel counts its beginning from Abraham. Spiritually, all believers in his greatest descendant, Christ, call him father. So rich was the harvest that came from him, and it came by faith. Abraham considered him faithful, who had made the promise. Abraham trusted a God who could never be unfaithful, and a promise that therefore could not remain unfulfilled. When it comes to God and his promises, the word impossible does not belong in a Christian's vocabulary. And then verses 13 to 16. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. The author has more to say about Abraham's faith. Before he does, though, he pauses to emphasize some common qualities found in Abraham's faith, as well as in the faith of the other patriarchs. All these died without receiving the things promised. Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, never saw God's promises fulfilled. Though Abraham lived to see Isaac's birth, he never saw the great nation that was to come from him. Though Jacob and Joseph saw this nation begin to grow, they never saw the Messiah who was to come from it. And yet they believed. Like Moses on Mount Nebo, viewing the promised land from a distance in Deuteronomy 32, they saw God's promises from afar and believed them. Faith's telescope brought God's promises into view so that the patriarchs are pictured as waiting in joyful anticipation of them. They admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. This was Abraham's confession in Genesis 23 when buying the burial plot for Sarah. But it was characteristic of all the heroes of faith. They were aliens, people of foreign descent and culture living in another land. They were strangers, people residing temporarily someplace other than in their real home. More than Canaan was meant was this, with this confession. The author rightly concludes, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Country means fatherland, the home from which you come and for which you long. Faith implants in the believer a homing instinct that will not allow him to root or rest here on earth. It was not of Mesopotamia the patriarchs were thinking when they looked for their homeland. If Abraham had wanted to return there, it would have been easy. All he had to do was pack his bags, pull up his ten stakes, and go. Jacob, when having served his uncle Laban 20 years in that very land, still wasn't satisfied. In Genesis 30, he begged his uncle, Send me on my way so that I can go back to my own homeland, namely Canaan. Not Mesopotamia, not Canaan, was on their minds and in their hearts, but a better country, a heavenly one. Toward the heavenly Canaan and the new Jerusalem, prepared for them by God, they stretched forth faith's hand in earnest longing all their days. No wonder God was not ashamed of call, to be called their God. To have God give us his name by bringing us to faith and into his family is great indeed. To have him take our name because of our God-given faith makes us catch our breath in wonder at his grace. In Exodus 3, he called himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and Jesus in Matthew 22 says the same. God grant that our names be added to the list. Can you read this section without being both rebuked and encouraged? 
I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home, we love to sing. But in life's reality, it's often so different. Eyes that should be raised heavenward are riveted on earth. Feet that should be tramping towards Canaan's shores are mired in earth's swamps. Hands that should be reaching for eternal treasures are wrapped around gaudy baubles. Backs that should be straining in kingdom effort are bent over in valueless pursuit. What a rebuke those portraits of faith speak to us, but also what encouragement. Press on, these portraits tell us. It's worth it. The God you trust is absolutely reliable. He means what he says, and he does what he promises. He said that heaven is your home, and there you shall surely stand with us at his right hand. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so uh, a great, great section to remind us uh, of not only of Abraham's faith, but uh, of what, what our true, true home uh, is. And think of how many times the Bible speaks about that. Uh, in in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, God describes our life here on this earth as a camping trip. Right? That, that we're, we're just here temporarily, uh, we have this, this permanent, permanent place. In the letters of Philippians, right? um, our citizenship is in heaven and we wait this, our Savior from there. Right? People that are living like this, right, they show that their, their, their homeland is here, but, uh, but we're, our citizenship is in, in heaven. Uh, that is a, a consistent theme throughout Scripture. Uh, and we see that then uh, represented in Hebrews 11. And I'm going to repeat what I said last week also about the, uh, the reminder and the thing to take, take note of here. Because uh, all we hear about is Abraham's faith. Right? When you read in Genesis, we hear Abraham uh, doubting. Right? He, God has to take him out in Genesis 15 and show him the stars. Uh, we see Abraham conniving with his wife to have a surrogate son. Uh, we see all these things that are taking place. We see Abraham passing his wife off as his sister because he's afraid. And he doesn't do that once, he does that twice. Right? Uh, we see all of those things, but none of those things are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Does God not want to air their dirty laundry? Is that why he doesn't mention it? Right? The history books kind of cover up, cover up all the bad stuff, right? It only talks about the good stuff. Is that what God is doing? Okay. Those sins are washed clean in the blood of Jesus. So when when the the, the letter to the Hebrews, when the writer to the Hebrews and the, and the, the Holy Spirit is choosing to give us this these uh, details about these believers' lives, all we hear about is their faith. Uh, because the blood of Jesus washes us pure from, from every, every sin. Um, and there is no sin. So when, when the New Testament is talking about these believers, it's not going back to all the bad stuff that they did, because that's all, that's all gone. Um, and that's the beauty of God's gift of faith that he gives to us. It clings to that forgiveness. Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that righteousness carries through for all eternity. Um, so in God's book of life, right, uh, when, when God opens his book of life for, for you, right, there are no sins in, in, in that book of life. They're all washed clean in the blood of Jesus. Um, and that's the, that's the beauty and the power of, of God. Right? The power of God is not in him sending lightning bolts down to crush those that oppose him. The real power of God is in the love and forgiveness that he gives us in Jesus. All right. Uh, let's look at, at the first question then. So when God commanded Abraham to move his household and live in Canaan, Abraham obeyed. Why did his faith make it possible for him to be content to move to Canaan and, and live in tents? To be a, no, a nomad, right? A wandering shepherd uh, is the way that Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob all describe themselves. They didn't have homes as such, but but his family had settled there in, in Haran, right, and, and were now kind of established in that area. Um, and so you would have you would have those areas that you would graze, uh, but you kind of had a home kind of kind of had a home base, right? Abraham didn't have a home base anymore, right? He's he's moving from 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 place to place um, and going going throughout, um, and. 
the uh, the reference that he makes to uh, I think it was Genesis 23 when he's buying the burial plot for 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 uh, Sarah after after Sarah passes away right and that becomes a family tomb. Um, that's the only piece of ground that Abraham actually owned in Canaan, the land that was promised to him. Right when he died, when his son Isaac died, when his grandson Jacob died, none of them had any plot of land in the land that God had said. And yet, why could Abraham pick up and move? And, and the writer of the Hebrews correctly says, right? He moved to, a, he, he started, started traveling and he didn't know where he was going. God says, you pack up and start traveling and I'll tell you when we get there. Right? There's no GPS. There's no, there's no destination that, that Abraham had. He was he was moving until God said, don't move. This is, this is a spot. Faith. All right. And what, and what did faith do? And, and this is, this is the, the key to faith. Faith trusts what God says. Right? God said, Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Abraham, I'm going to give you a land, and that land... In that land is where your nation is going to grow, and from that nation, all nations on the earth are going to be blessed. Now remember, Abraham is 75 years old when God gives him that promise, and he, and he, moves, he, he begins moving. Uh, 25 years, right? So think of what you were doing 25 years ago. Okay? 25 years ago would be 1997. Okay? 1997, I was still serving the first congregation that I, that I, that I served in Michigan. Um, I was teaching preschool. You were teaching preschool. Mm -hmm. We were living in Florida. Okay, you were in Florida. I was still working for AMC in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> I just started living in Florida. Hey, were you in Germany at that time? Nope, I was going to UAH. Okay, you were going to UAH too, if I, okay. You're, okay, so you were you weren't even in the in the United States at that time. Okay, ninety eight. Okay, so you know, think of twenty, and so think of what the Lord has done in twenty five years. Uh, now, had God said twenty five years ago, okay, that on this day at this time that we would be here studying His Word together, uh, right? Could we could we hold on to that and say, okay, this is what I'm this is what I'm going to do because uh, you know now again God didn't give. Abraham a timeline. He said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. He's 75. Sarah's 10 years younger, right? She's 65. And they don't have any kids, right? For God to make a promise that you're going to be a great nation, right? In order to, in order to start a great nation, you have to have a son, right? Uh, they don't have any kids, right? So you think of all these things that God said to Abraham that were completely beyond the realm of reality for them. Right? I uh, think of, you know, uh, and again, Abraham lived to be uh, 175 years old, so he lived another 100 years after, after that. Uh, but Sarah, Sarah died fairly, fairly early. Uh, right? So um, she, she died at 100, 130, I think it was, 127, 130, something like that. Abraham remarried you. He has a second family of 120, according to mm -hmm. right. So, all right. So, uh, so we have right. We have these uh, right. So after Sarah dies, yeah, he he does marry and has six more six more kids. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but uh, you look at you look at at uh, what the Lord had promised, right? And he's going into a place where he's a foreigner, right? Now, granted, Abraham's a very wealthy man, right? He takes, he takes his servants and his flocks and his nephew and, and, and his, his entourage go. So this, this is a huge caravan that's, that's going, right? Remember, um, he has his own, he has enough uh, servants where he has uh, enough to have his own private army. So, you know, Abraham is a, is a very wealthy man. Uh, but as he's traveling he doesn't know where he's going, right? With all these people around him, um, he still doesn't doesn't have a family. Um, 
to the point where he's ready to ready to, ready to make his his business manager, his chief servant Eliezer, um, his heir, so that he can carry on his name. And you know, is that is that what you want me to do? And God says, No, a son coming from your own body, right? So then he gets gets a, he and Sarah. You know, that's when they decide, okay, let's let's uh, you know, you you can marry marry Hagar and and have a, a son that way. And God says, No. You and Sarah, right? So God has to get more specific because Abraham keeps going in directions that God says, "No, that's not that's not the direction that you're you're to go." Um, but the the patience, right, and the confidence of of trusting in in God's promises uh, is. Uh, but he was content to do this because he knew that what God said, God was going to do. And that really is the grasp of faith, isn't it? Faith is confidence that what God says and the promises that he makes are always going to be kept and, and fulfilled. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, this was going to be the, the land that, that his, his nation was going to, going to come from. And so he was, he was content to live that way. Even if his eyes didn't actually see that, right? So, so by the time Abraham dies, um, right, uh, he has his his son Isaac, right? He marries Rebecca, and they have Jacob and Esau, right? So Abraham lives long enough to see his his two grandsons. But when Abraham dies. It's a, it's a family of five. That's it. Right? That's not a great nation. Right? Five people are not a great nation. Uh, but Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as, as righteousness. So like, like Noah's faith then, uh, number two, Abraham's faith in the promised land was linked to his faith in something more long term. And what, what is that? And verse, verse 10 kind of takes us, takes us back to that. Um, and so verse 10 again For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So God's promise rested on a son and a nation. And then from that nation, all nations on the earth are going to be blessed. Uh, what, what was the long-term thing then that, that Abraham's faith was grasping? He's had heirs. Okay, so he's going to be a great nation. Right. All right? Is that great nation saving faith? Okay? It's, it's included. Right? And Abraham describes himself as this restless wanderer. He's looking forward to having a, a permanent home okay. right. that God has built for him. Exactly. And that permanent home, a city with foundations, right? A permanent place, and that place is heaven, right? Which is connected to God's promises, which was connected to, from that nation, all nations on the earth are going to be blessed, right? So, and that's why, that helps us maybe to understand Genesis 15 a little bit better too, when, when uh, God takes him out and shows him the stars and says, count these stars if you can. That's how many descendants that you're going to have. And then the Bible tells, simply says, Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So how, how, does, how does looking up at stars count as righteousness, right? Because of the connection that God, that God had, had made, right? That connection with that promise, right? And that's why God continually goes back to that faith of Abraham. Not the bloodline of Abraham, but the faith of Abraham. Right? Abraham is the father of, of believers. Um, and so it's, it's not, uh, and, and God is very consistent through Old Testament as well as New Testament on uh, that his children, right, his chosen people are those that carry the same faith as Abraham. Uh, and that was proven in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. Uh, we have plenty of examples in the Old Testament of people outside the bloodline of Abraham that were part of the chosen people of, of God. 
right? Uh, women like Rahab and Ruth, um, the the, uh, the the commander the commander of Naaman, right? Uh, you have all these all these people, the uh, the Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman, right? Uh, and the widow at Zarephath, right? Uh, this all these all these people that were that were touched. Uh, by the truth of, of God's word and carried the same faith that Abraham did. They didn't carry the bloodline, but they carried the same faith. And God credited that as righteousness. Um, and that really is, is the key, right? God's promises uh, were more than just, this is the land that, I, that my, my descendants get to, get to live, right? Um, now, the land was a big deal. Yeah, it, God, God settled them in, in that land and God used that portion of, of the world uh, to carry out the fulfillment of his promise to send a savior and also to carry out the fulfillment of sending the gospel out into the world. Uh, and, and I think I mentioned this in one of our previous Bible, Bible studies not too long ago. Uh, but if you look at a, at a map of uh, the, the, the main parts of the first century world, uh, Jerusalem is pretty much smack dab in the middle. And so when God says, go out into all the world, right, Jerusalem is, is center. And so you're going north, south, east, west, uh, and, and you're, out, you're going out from Jerusalem to, to be, able to, be able to share that. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful picture of, of how God, God set everything. Uh, so yes, the physical land uh, was was a part of this. Uh, it's it's the the area of the of the world in which God used to fulfill His plan of salvation, uh, but that wasn't the main part of the promise. The main part of the promise was what was going to take place in that in that part of the world and the Savior, which was going to come to fulfill God's plan of salvation. And so uh, that also helps us to understand. Uh, this city with foundations, because Abraham knew that his body was as good as dead, even when even when uh, when Isaac was born, right? And so, uh, a body that's as good as dead, clinging to a promise, means there's something beyond his eyes closing in death, right? This city with foundations, which whose architect uh, is is God. Uh, which, which helps us to understand that even those ancient believers had a full understanding of eternal life and a resurrection from the dead. <laughs> Looking forward to, e to eternity with uh, an eternal uh, paradise with, with God. Yes, Gwen. Um, what we're in Ezekiel right now, what I'm seeing is they, the Israelites at that time, they seemed to really think that Jerusalem was their safety, their, mm -hmm. their Yes. They um, they seem to think that God would never destroy Jerusalem because that's where you know, that was the city. That that's brought out very clearly in yeah. Jeremiah also. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so the so you must still be in the first part yeah. of Ezekiel. Yeah. 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 So you have the first half of Ezekiel where God is is coming down and saying yeah because yeah, they're still hopeful right because Ezekiel is one of the first of the exiles right and he's mm -hmm. he's a prophet to the exiles who right. have taken before right. yeah. Jerusalem. Uh, is destroyed. And then about halfway through Ezekiel is when Jerusalem gets destroyed, and now the people are just completely devastated. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, that's when God lifts, lifts them up uh, with, the, with the promises. But, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, all the things that he's doing at the beginning, you know, reminding them, uh, Jerusalem is not your savior. That's right. um, and and uh, Jeremiah had the same, had the same roadblocks in his, in his life, right? God would never destroy the temple. This is his yeah. dwelling place. Yeah. Um, right, and all the false prophets, right, were kept kept saying, "Why are you prophesying against God's temple?" Right? right? Uh, why are you Why are you saying these these things? Um, yeah. And that is that is a very uh, realistic, right? And so um, it's it's so easy to get focused more on the place yeah. rather than what is taking place yeah. uh, at that place and the promises that are being proclaimed. Yeah. Um, and and that's that is our typical sinful human nature, right? We we tend to latch on to whatever is concrete around us, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so you know whether it's it's the place from which, mm -hmm. right? So um, it has to be it has to be the church or um, or the or 
you know, something tangible like, like the person, right? Um, and so what happens, right? People get attached to people rather than, than the message, right? They get atta more attached to the messenger than the actual message. Uh, and, and God warns about that as, as well, right? Um, and uh, the Apostle Paul addresses that very clearly. That was one of the ch biggest challenges in the, in the uh, congregation at Corinth also. Uh, right? Some follow. Some say I follow Apollos. Some say I follow Paul. Some say I follow Peter. Some say I follow Jesus. Right? Uh, you know, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. God's the one who make, makes it grow. Right? So it's it's about the the power of that of that message uh, rather than than the the face uh, and the voice of the one speaking that that message. Um, yeah, the section we just read. It was like the Israelites were. Um, they felt like the exile. Right. Like, you are the ones that we feel sorry for you mm -hmm. because it's clear that God has forsaken you, yeah. and we're yeah. the you know the chosen ones. Right. So it's really yeah. interesting. No, and and uh, and if you if you look at at even today in the twenty first century, the the concept of um, you know the the Jews coming back to to power, right? It still all centers in on Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it has to be uh -huh. Jerusalem, yeah. right? And and. Uh, and the, the strictest of the Orthodox Jews have everything uh, ready, actually, to, to go to begin temple worship again. If, uh, once, they, once they can eliminate uh, the Muslims from, from the, the Dome of the Rock, um, tear that down, rebuild the temple, um, they've got, they've got uh, you know, the high priest line set up, they've got the red heifer, they've got the altars ready to, to, to begin, begin the regular temple worship all over again and go back to to uh, the the good old days, yeah. um, which again uh, is a is a sad reminder of the latching on to the externals rather than than what was what was the picture behind that. Um, and when we see the picture behind that, then we can we can we can read um, you know some of those Old Testament books in particular. Um, for example, I, do, I think we've talked about this before, right? Uh, if uh, looking at the book of Leviticus. Right and and I've talked to some of you, you know, reading through Leviticus. Right, all these all these animals and the sacrifices and the what parts of the animal were supposed to be sacrificed, what parts were to be eaten by the priests, what parts were to be taken out and 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 burned outside the camp uh, for this sacrifice. This was done for this. It's like oh, it's just so boring. Right? How can I? Uh, it, but. And, and if I'm, all I'm doing is looking at the externals of all those rules and regulations, say, yeah, they had all those rules. I'm so glad we don't have all those rules now. Um, but what, what God was doing was painting very specific pictures of the forgiveness that we have in the blood of Jesus. So that when Jesus comes on the scene, right, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, right? And, and that, that highlights then the, the sacrifice. And... Um, and then earlier, right, in the letter to the Hebrews, where um, the Lord is, is describing Jesus as high priest, then it compares the high priests, right, who are sacrificing the animals. And before they can sacrifice for the people, they have to sacrifice for themselves, but, but not Jesus, right? Jesus is the, the great high priest. Jesus is the one um, who sacrificed once and for all. Uh, and so no more sacrifice for sin is, is needed. Um, just such such vivid pictures that uh, that that God God paints for us um, in Old Testament as well as in New Testament, which then hopefully helps us uh, to read the Old Testament scriptures uh, in a whole new light, uh, and uh, to say, well, there's Jesus, and there's Jesus, and there's Jesus, virtually in every page of the Old Testament, uh, as we see God's promises unfolding. Otherwise, it's just a history of God's people. Right? And some Bible stories that shows how God took care of his people. Uh, but so much more than that. Right? Uh, because when we, when we think of, of the scriptures as one complete unit, uh, which is the way God has given them to us, over a span of 1,500 years, all focusing in on the promises to send the Savior and the promises fulfilled and how that message spread. Yes. That yes. Really good. Yeah. That, uh, so yeah. Yeah. Professor Jeske does a, a wonderful, wonderful job there. He was one of my Old Testament professors. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Just. Um, he also wrote the Genesis People's Bible. Okay. The same same author. <clears throat> 
All right, number three. Why was Abraham able to become the father of Isaac and the father of many nations? How does, how does God describe it? Even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, he was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who made the promise. All right, it was the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, God, God's miracle. But again, what does faith do? It believes what God has promised. It believes what God has promised. And what did God promise, right? That's when he's 99 years old, God appears to him again, and he says, one year from now, you and Sarah will hold your baby." And as, as the, the Holy Spirit reminds us here, right? He cons Abraham considered him faithful who had made the promise, right? God, he, so Abraham considered God faithful because he had made this promise. God is faithful to his promise. So if God says that Sarah and I are going to have a baby, we're going to have a baby. And, and that really is what makes faith so simple. I, I think we try, we try to, to complex faith so often. And you know, this and you know, these. It's simply faith takes God at his word. When God says something, faith holds on to that. Go ahead. Yeah, it's going to be in the section I think we have. Um, okay. Yeah, the section section next time. Yeah, with with Isaac, yeah. right? So he knows. You know, even though he doesn't know how, he's like, I know. Even if you know God tells me to do this, I know that somehow either he'll bring Isaac back or. No, and and he says specifically, yeah, the writer of the Hebrews gets us gets us into Abraham's brain and says yeah. Abraham was yeah. fully Abraham wasn't just it's okay, God. You can stop me anytime. You can stop me anytime. Right, right. No. Uh, yeah, he picked, uh, Genesis clearly says he picked up the knife to, yep. to, to sacrifice yeah. his son um, and was fully in, intent on doing it, trusting that God would, would bring, not that he would give him another son right. because this right. is the son of the promise, right? right? Yeah. And that's what made it, that's what made that, that command mm -hmm. uh, so, so heart-wrenching. Yeah. Um, and We'll save the rest of that discussion for, for next time, but but uh, but no, as but just the but the the very fact of Abraham and Sarah having this baby at 100 years old, uh, you know, Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90, well past the age of childbearing, uh, barren, uh, and yet God God did this, uh, and. And God doesn't, you know, doesn't give us any indication that this was, uh, you know, this wasn't an immaculate conception like Jesus. Uh, you know, the same as Zechariah and Elizabeth, right? They're both beyond the age of, of childbearing as, as well. And, and God blesses them with, with John. Um, and so uh, the Lord goes beyond whatever this human mind says, no, nah, that's, that's not that's not that's not possible. And I like the way the, the writer says, right? With uh, with God uh, and and trusting in God, that means the word impossible does not exist. Nothing is impossible for God. All right? There's things that are impossible. You know, that goes back to the disciples' question after the rich young man walks away, and right, Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich rich person to get into heaven. And said, Well, Lord, who can be saved then? He said, Well, with man, this is impossible but not with God, right? The, the word impossible doesn't exist with God. Um, and, uh, and, that's, and that is, is really what, uh, you know, and somebody, somebody said, you know, during, during a drought when people get together to pray for rain, bring an umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. um, that, <laughs> that shows that you're trusting in God's promises, right? Um, if I'm going to show up to pray for rain and I, I you know, I, uh, you know, don't bring any any rain boots or anything. Do I do I really am I really confident that God's going to send the rain? 
Um, you know, and, and that, you know, we, we believe and we don't, we, we do our best not to doubt. Now, we do know, right, the reality that, that Abraham and Sarah did doubt and they did sin during that time. Uh, but again, those sins are all washed clean in the blood of Jesus and none of that is mentioned here in, in Hebrews chapter, chapter 11. Um, and so uh, they considered that God who made this promise that they were going to have this son was faithful to that promise and would keep that promise. And yes, they did hold uh, their son in, in, their, in their arms. Um, and uh, and I, uh, I find uh, that that section is such a beautiful section because uh, when we see uh, God making that promise to Abraham, uh, Abraham laughs. He's just so excited. You know, God's made this promise. I've been waiting 24 years for this promise, and now, now it's coming. And he laughs, right? And then the Lord and his two angels show up at the tent, right? And they make, Abraham makes his feast for them, and Abraham talks again. Uh, Sarah's at the tent, right? And she's inside the tent listening, and uh, she laughs, but her laughter isn't is a little bit different, right? Uh, will you know? Will I really be able to have you know? I'm I'm 90 years old. You know what? Is, can I really have this? Uh, and they said, well, why did you laugh? I said, well, I didn't laugh. I said, no, this will really happen. But then uh, that next year when she does have a have, uh, baby, she laughs again, and they name their son Isaac, which means laughter. Uh, so uh, that, that laughter, laughter with, with joy, uh, knowing that's, that uh, God has, has made and, and kept, that, kept that promise. Okay? Now, Abraham, at any time, he could have returned to Haran and lived in comfort with his relatives, right? He, he, uh, he chose to, to follow, follow God's, uh, God's instructions, and he, he obeyed and became a tent dweller in, in Canaan. Um, and the description never, never says anything, but, you know, we know about his doubts and things. You think he ever, uh, you know got fed up one night and said, you know, okay, I'm going to pack my bags the next morning. He thinks twice and doesn't go, but, you know, uh, you know that, that is probably a reality, right? Remember, uh, God doesn't, uh, in the Old Testament, when God is, is relaying these things, um, he presents these heroes of faith uh, with warts and all, right? Uh, God does not hide anything from us, um, and I find that very comforting. Because I think it's, it's oftentimes that we think of these heroes of faith and how strong their faith was and say, oh, I could never be like, like that. I could never have that strong of a faith. Um, and so God presents us with their, their need for forgiveness as well. And they're clinging to that forgiveness. Chi Chi. <coughs> You could, yeah. Yeah. I've always related to Abraham. And I wouldn't, I don't know that I think he wanted to go back home. He probably missed his relative, but since God separated him because his relatives were still pagans, and God called him out of that, which I can totally relate to my yeah. family. Yeah. I mean, you can miss that, but I doubt he wanted to go back there. Mm -hmm. You know, God separated him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't just leaving family. It was. It was uh, away from from the worship of of the of the false gods, which God clearly explains throughout. Uh, we see that with with Isaac when, uh, or, or with Jacob when he returns. Uh, we see that with Joshua when he says, "You know, are you going to worship the, the gods of your ancestors, or are you going to worship worship the Lord?" Yeah. Very very definitely. Yes, John. I, in my reading. Set. And they were, back in those days, they lived hundreds of years. And 
so there was so much overlap, one family to another one that there was, and of course, the grandfather, the patriarch of his family, was the chief priest of that family. And that, you know, so for what it's worth. Mm -hmm. Well, and and they, but but understand also that God is is was very clear about about the other the other gods. So uh, you know, did they know the true God? Yes, right. Because when when God calls Abraham, Abraham understands and, and Abraham goes, yeah. right. Because of uh, probably of, of what he has learned from his father and grandfather and so forth. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, as long as as those generations passed it along, right? Because that was one of the that was one of the great great things, and we've seen that uh, very clearly also throughout the history of God's people. Uh, you know, tell it to the next generation, and and uh, sometimes it happened, sometimes it didn't. Right. 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 <clears throat> okay. Uh, and so uh, you know. That, that one is more more speculations but uh, if we look at number five now uh, these last these last four are more uh, applying applying this now uh, as Christians of what country are we citizens we are citizens of heaven right uh, and as as the Lord tells us in, in Philippians chapter 3 right our citizenship is in heaven uh, we have a dual citizenship right we are we are part of this of this world, uh, but our real home is is heaven, um, and so uh, God regularly describes our lives here on this earth as this temporary dwelling. Uh, and uh, if we're in a temporary dwelling, then we long we long to be home. Uh, and uh, go ahead, Marilyn. Uh, and you said that's in Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter five. Yeah, that um, that first. That first part of, of chapter 5, let me just read that real, real, real quick. It says, we know that if, if the earthly dwelling, or if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we're clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Right? So uh, I like to describe that section as a, as a bad camping trip. Uh, right? So um, I'm not talking about glamping, right? where you go with a nice trailer and you've got your air conditioning and things like that. Um, this, is, this is primitive tent camping. Right? And primitive tent, have anybody ever been primitive tent, tent camping? Okay? Yes, as soon as I put the stake in the ground, that happens more often. I can keep going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every, every pioneer trip I ever took, yeah, and I remember I remember talking to Pastor Beckman because the, when when the kids when his kids were young they used to go camping all the time, and more often than not they ended up either in a hotel or going back home because and they, he still talked about one time where they they were in in um, uh, a hilly area and it started raining and the water was just rushing down into the tent and right there's there's nothing better. Then getting back home, taking a shower, getting back into your warm bed uh, after after a miserable experience like that, and that's the way God describes our time here on this earth versus being home in in heaven, right? Uh, with just that 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 peaceful relaxation and and joy of knowing that uh, I'm I'm home again, uh, and uh, and and if you think about it, right? What what things do we leave behind in order to be to be a citizen of heaven? Okay. Now, I I think this is a little bit more difficult question for us living in the United States with so many blessings. Uh, you know that that I don't I don't know what hardship is. I really don't. Uh, I've I've always had enough to eat. I've always had clothes on my back. I've always had a roof over my head. I've always had transportation. Um, I have never been without, a, you know. Uh, I I just don't know what that's like. Uh, so this this is a little harder for 
for, for me personally to answer because uh, I thank the Lord that I, I, I haven't had to give up a lot of things. Uh, Chi Chi. Exactly. But it calls me to leave. It leaves mm -hmm. this relationship to get away. Am I willing to say no to that? To come exactly. To his kingdom and live the way he would have me live. Yep. And that really is, is the heart and core of what this is. It isn't so much the material as it is oftentimes relational. Um, the, the desires of the sinful nature, all of those things to say, uh, I am setting this aside because my citizenship is in heaven. John. Well, you know, when we leave when we, like when I graduated from college, I left my mother and father and moved to Minneapolis. And then that Maryland, we established a new, a new home with this family. So, you know, it's part of the teachings, of Christian teachings. You, you leave your mother and father and you're joined with your wife and you expect to procreate and have children. And, and so it, it's, it's kind of a parallel. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. that's the good right what um, uh, Chi Chi is saying is there's all these options yeah and it's yeah. saying no to all those other and I may yeah, I may have to have to uh, yeah. dissolve a friendship because that friend uh, may be trying to drag me into into places that are going to make me and situations that that uh, I may have to you know set my faith aside which which I don't want to do, right? And so those those hard choices of, uh, yeah, the things that, that we do or refuse to do, the things, the associations that we refuse to, to make. Uh, I think of my, my brother-in-law. Um, he, he lost several jobs throughout his career uh, because he was, uh, he, he was uh, in the accounting field and he was working as controllers for, for different companies and there was more than once uh, where he, I would say, um, left slash got got let go about the about the you know he's I'm not going to work here and say well you, if you're not going to do this you can't you know he he was asked to sign off on things that he knew were 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 not right and he said this is first of all it's it's incorrect right he had several he had a number of reasons yeah. for doing it right mm -hmm. uh, just like Joseph had a number of reasons of saying no to Potiphar's wife. Right there, he could have gotten into big trouble. There's all kinds of things that that he that could have happened. But he said, "How can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God?" Uh, you know, my brother-in-law ended up the same same thing. He he left a lot. He ended up leaving at least two or three different jobs uh, because they were asking him to do do things, um, and they wanted him to sign off on on things that he knew were were unethical. And and uh, and he said, "You know, as a Christian, I can't do that." Uh, and by God's grace, he always blessed him with a better job. Sometimes he had to wait several months, but um, he always found another place to work, and, and it always always turned out well for him. Uh, but uh, but God doesn't promise that either, right? He doesn't promise that if uh, you know Joseph did everything right and still got thrown into prison, right? Um, and so uh, that is a, a reminder of the the blessings that are ours uh, as Christians are oftentimes eternal blessings that we may not see. I think um, one of the biggest challenges for us as Christians is to understand the word blessing. And that the word blessing often, the blessings don't often look like blessings. They may look like curses. Uh, they may make life harder for us. Uh, but they, But when God blesses us, it's always with an eternal perspective. And to... And that's that's probably the biggest challenge for us in our in our lives as as believers. Yes, Chi Chi. Yeah, um, I, was, I went to a church in Dallas this uh, weekend, and he told him pray, and he said, you know, how we see their temptation and their trials, and he said it depends on how you look at it. Of course, the God doesn't tempt us to do evil, but when circumstances or things are not going our way, he said 
you can choose to look at it as God's testing you. Mm -hmm. And when God tests you, it's for your good, because it turns out for our good. But because we're so sinful, Mm -hmm. and we think God, you know, God's love is making everything go the way we want it to go, Mm -hmm. we just never see it as that. But he said, you know, if we trust God, Mm -hmm. and look at it through his eyes, then those tests result in our blessing. Exactly. Yeah, because that same event, God is using it to bless us and Satan is using it to tempt us, right? At the very same time. Same situation. Uh, and, that's, and that's where, again, faith that clings to the promises of God that says I, that in all things I'm working for your, for your benefit. Uh, to cling to those words even when everything around me that I'm seeing and hearing uh, and experiencing says, says otherwise. And that's uh, that's a big that's a that's a challenge for us. Uh, number seven, um, verse sixteen uh, reminds us again. Uh, Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. Uh, so this. Uh, that verse helps us when uh, we're tempted to uh, return. Uh, you know, when we're tempted to return to the to the spiritual country we left. In other words, uh, when when those those struggles are are there, right? The, what we've just been talking about uh, that that uh, remind us that that this is uh, this is what God has done for us. God has prepared a, a home for us, and clinging to His promises even when I'm tempted to forsake those promises, uh, results in, in that, that peace and this eternal home that, that God has, has already won for me. Uh, it is there. Uh, and uh, uh, saw a, a, a movie on, on uh, this, this last weekend on uh, some of the persecution that the Christians in Japan faced in the 1600s and the, the Jesuit Jesuit missionaries uh, and what they what they faced as well and uh, you know the torture and and um, you know the, but it could all go away right if they just stepped on stepped on Jesus and denied denied their faith then everything would be fine right and and the the Jesuit priest was struggling with it more so than the Japanese Christians because they they kept focusing on uh, per, per, Paris. Parisio is our, is, you know, paradise mm-hmm. uh, that they, and they said, okay, and, and he had one conversation with one of the, the, the young Christian ladies and, uh, and said, you know, it, you know, she kept saying paradise, paradise, and, she, and he said, yes, and, you, you know, and this, uh, and so she began looking at it, you know, because he, he didn't want them to suffer, and she's like, but if I receive paradise uh, at the end of this, it's much better than what I'm facing right now, right? This this camping trip is really rough right now, uh, you know. In the words of that we've been that we've been uh, saying, right? So um, the this this realization. Um, sometimes people will will uh, one of the criticisms that's said, been said of Christians. The last question uh, that Christians are so heavenly minded that they are worthless for anything important on this earth. Um, how how can we respond to that false? That false charge. Well, we get false sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I've seen Christians, who, I mean, I get why they're saying, well, yeah. I see what you're saying, but sometimes the Christians are, let me use Nigerian Christians. Okay. That's, I've seen them, oh, yeah. you know, making heaven, I'm going to heaven. I'm like, well, heaven is there, but you're not treating the people around you, you know, like right. the Bible tells them to treat. Yeah. You know? So it's like, okay. Who are you winning over? Who's your life? Right. Pointing to God, or are you so focused on heaven that you forget that God wants you to take people? You know. Well, and you. and uh, the Lord actually addresses that to the Thessalonians also, right? They were so eager for Jesus to return that they they stopped working, they stopped taking care of their families, and and finally the Lord says, if if you will not work, neither will you eat, right? Um, and so we keep one eye on heaven, and we keep one eye uh, on, on the service that we that we give to God um, in doing the best with the abilities, but also right in serving each day as a witness for Jesus 
so that others may may know that that truth as well. John. The Pharisees, first of all, I've heard that term many times, and it's usually people who are very rigid and uh, not loving, and you know, kind of like the Pharisees in the Jewish times, they were so heavenly minded because they obeyed the law to the letter, but they forsook the sympathy and empathy and, and help and love for their fellow men. Yeah. Yeah, so I can have my nose in the Bible every day, but uh, but if I can't if I can't treat if I can't treat my my fellow people, especially my fellow Christians, uh, with with love and and respect and kindness, um, then you know, as as James would say, what good is that faith? Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's faith without if it's not accompanied by a life of faith is 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 really dead, right? It's worthless. Uh, and so, uh, and that's uh, that's the importance of of doing everything with with heaven in mind. Uh, is to uh, we actually can do the best that we can without worrying about the results. Uh, we can uh, speak the truth in love without being concerned uh, about you know how is how is this going to you know I think sometimes we're we're almost more worried about what people think of us than what God thinks of us. Right, that's that's one of the dangers that we can fall into um, in our in our lives, uh, and so uh, these uh, the opportunities that the Lord gives us to to be His witnesses and to to live that that life of faith uh, helps us to uh, to have have not only the heavenly mindedness but also to uh, look out for for each other in our earthly lives as well. All right. Then um, next time, then we'll take a look at at uh, uh, the middle part of the chapter, seventeen to twenty-eight, uh, looking at Abraham to Moses. All right. Let's close tonight with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for this gift of faith. Help our faith to uh, that you've given to us to cling to your words and promises. Uh, not only to know what you say, uh, but to reflect that in our life in our attitude, in our words, in our actions, in everything that we do and say, uh, with strangers, with unbelievers, with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, with everyone. Uh, Lord, guide us that, that we may live that faith and uh, cling to your words and promises in all that we do. And in your name we ask it. Amen. Amen.